Our reading this morning is Psalm 96. You can find it on page 602 of the Church Bibles. Psalm 96, beginning at verse 1. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvellous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord, and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendour and majesty are before him, strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendour of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and all the peoples in his faithfulness. This is the word of the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for all that you've done for us in Christ. And I pray that now you would really convince us of what we've just sung, that you're the best, you're our rest, you're the one who fills our heart's desires. But more than that, Lord, please lift us to think of others, those who do not know you, that we would long, because of what we read now in Psalm 96, we would long that they too would be able to sing that song with us. So please speak to us by the power of your spirit and through your living word. Amen. Please have a seat and open up to Psalm 96 on page 602. Now, some things are too good to keep to yourself. Some things are just too good to keep to yourself. I want you to imagine a, a man looking through a telescope. That is beautiful. That comet is stunning. Wow. Hey, son, son. Son, look at, you've got to see this comet. It's, it's stunning. Son, son, what are you doing? What's that? Son, son, what are, you, what are you doing? You've got to see this. Playing Candy Crush. So, don't, don't play Candy Crush. Come and, come and look at this. It's beautiful. It comes, comes once every thousand years. It's, it's, it's beautiful. Some things are just too good to keep to yourself. Now, mission is driven by this same dynamic, that some things are too good to keep to yourself. When you watch an amazing football match or you meet an amazing guy or girl, when a child gets a present they've wanted for ages or you become a grandparent for the first time, some things are just too good to keep to yourself and you burst to tell someone, to show them the photo, to show them the YouTube clip. Some of you have been on the receiving end of my mum, coming round with pictures of the grandchildren. You've got to see! Christian mission, our task of sharing Christ with the world is driven by this dynamic that some things are too good to keep to yourself. How is your passion for sharing Christ? How is St. John's doing when it comes to world mission, raising, sending, supporting workers to make Christ known in the world? Well, the health and the drive of our engagement in mission will rise or fall on how much we get that the God we worship is too good to keep to ourselves. And Psalm 96 is kind of bursting with this passion to share what has been seen about God. It vibrates with an energy uh, driven by a desire to not keep God to ourselves. 
So here's what we're going to see in Psalm 96. First, we're going to look at this uh, dynamic of God being too good to keep to ourselves. And then we're going to look at two reasons the psalm gives to really persuade us how too good God is. So first, let's look at this, that God's too good to keep to ourselves. Verse 1. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. The psalmist calls the whole world to sing to the Lord. Why does he talk about singing? Because singing is what we do when we're, we're bursting with joy. It's very hard to be happy quietly. I'm really happy quietly. Have you ever sat on a train next to someone where they're reading a really funny book? They're insufferable because they're like... <laughs> <laughs> and you're next to them thinking, what are you reading? And they're just chuckling away to themselves because they're just enjoying it so much. We make a noise when we're enjoying something, when it's good. Even the kind of British reserve can't be suppressed. That, that humans, we struggle to be happy quietly. And so the psalmist looks around all the earth and wants everyone to be noisily happy with him. And things get really noisy over in verse 11. Let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. That's noisy happiness, isn't it? Imagine if trees sang. Imagine how noisy Pearson's Park would be if the trees sang. Imagine how loud the humber would be if it hummed with joy and praise. You see, the psalmist isn't content to sing his happy little song by himself to God. He's not content for St. John's to get together on a Sunday and sing with gusto while the world around remains silent as stone. He looks at these four walls that contain the sound of our singing on a Sunday to God, and he says, God's too good to keep to ourselves. God's too good for the singing to stop here. I want you to see also how wide his vision is for the whole world. Let's just have a look at some of the words. Um, Verse 1, he says, Sing to the Lord all the earth. Verse 3, declare his glory among the nations, among all peoples. Go down to verse 7. Describe to the Lord all you families of nations. Um, Down to verse, um, verse 10, say among the nations. Do you see that his vision is for all people, and he talks about peoples, that means ethno-linguistic groups, all of them in the world. He says, all of you sing to God. So do you have a heart to share Christ with those nearest and dearest to you? I hope you do. Do you have a heart to tell your neighbors about Jesus? I hope you do. Does St. John's have a desire to tell all of Hull about God? I know you do. Do you care about the UK hearing about Jesus? I hope you do. But if our drive stops with those closest to us or is limited by the coast of this island, we've stopped well short of the vision of Psalm 96. Now, it was a really big deal for uh, the psalmist to think this expansively and this big. Because God to the Old Testament people was while the creator of all things was very much the God of Israel, the God of one particular ethno-linguistic group, the Jews. He was the God of Israel who had one particular geographical place, the, the promised land of Israel. And in ancient times, and still in many places today, most gods are kind of local gods. Each nation has its own God, and no one really expects everyone to worship them. It's a bit like how Hull has its own little quirks. We have white telephone boxes. What color are yours? The Egyptians have their gods. The Babylonians have theirs. And the Hebrews have the Lord, Yahweh, each to their own. Oh, but this God is too good to keep to one patch of land in the Middle East. Too good only to be praised on Jewish lips. And so as the psalmist looked at the limitations of the borders of Israel, his call to the world to join him in singing in verse 2 turns to a call to mission. Verse 2, sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. Those are evangelism words, aren't they? These are don't keep God to yourself words. Declare him what he's done. 
Proclaim him. How are people going to sing to God if his salvation isn't declared to them? You can't praise a God you haven't heard of. You can't sing a song you don't know. My daughter Rosie does this to me. She's like, Daddy, sing the song about the birds. I'm like, what song about it? Sing it, Daddy. I don't know the song. She's insistent. She's like, Father Jack. She's like, sing the song, Daddy. And I don't, I don't know what it is. You can't sing a song you don't know. You can't enjoy a God you've never heard of. So we're going to have to go and teach the world the song we sing. Verse 1, teach them a new song. When God's too good to keep to ourselves, we need to go and proclaim and declare him to others. We're going to have to be like my mum who goes up and down the aisles with the photos of the grandkids coming. Have a look, have a look. We're going to need to be like Paul who went up and down the Mediterranean, proclaiming to people the glory of Jesus Christ and proclaiming his marvelous deeds of salvation. So let me ask, are you too content to just sing your song on a Sunday? Maybe too content to have your relationship with God, but you're not driven maybe by this idea that God's just too good to keep to yourself. So maybe we just need a bit more convincing that God's too good to keep to ourselves. So let's turn to the psalmist's two reasons that he gives us. First thing he says is God's too good to keep to ourselves because he's better. Verse 4. For... Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. So he said, sing to God, all the earth. Why? Verse 4, for, here's the reason, he is to be feared above all gods. Basically saying, God's better than all the other gods. In the how much honor does your God deserve competition, the Lord comes top. He's to be feared above any other God. He's just better. You see, if there's one thing that's true of all humans everywhere, is that we worship gods. Our hearts are restless to find something to give us a sense of, this is why I'm here, and this is what's going to make everything okay. That's what a God is, the answer to your needs, uh, the provider of significance. Here's a kind of diagnostic question to ask, to work out what gods we worship. How do you finish this sentence? Everything will be all right when what? What comes into your mind? Everything will be all right when that thing that answers that question that will make everything all right in life is a God to us. So across the 7 billion people on this planet, there's going to be a range of answers to that question. Everything will be all right when I reach enlightenment, says the Buddhist. Everything will be all right when Allah decides to be merciful to me and reward my devotion, says the Muslim. Everything will be all right when my family's happy, says the mum. Everything will be all right when Mr. and Mrs. Wright come along, says the 20-something Brit. These are the things which grip us and which we live for. Our gods, everything will be all right when... That thing does what I need. And the psalmist says, yeah, but there's only one that's, verse 4, most worthy of praise. Of all the things we humans look to to fix life, to shape what we live for, he's to be feared above all of them. Why, verse 5, for all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. They're idols. It means they're created things that are treated as if they're gods. Now, in ancient times, it could be that the sun was seen as a source of hope and worshipped. Or a god thought to be in the heavens was um, represented in a little statue. But, But the Lord made the heavens. Oh, you could worship the sun, but he made the sun. You could live for your family, but he made your family. It's it's like the difference between seeing a tribute band or the real thing. Led Zeppelin or Dread Zeppelin. Abba or Gabba, this is my favorite. The Smiths or the Ian Duncan Smiths. (laughs) Why go and live for these created things, which, by the way, will let you down, when you could have the original maker of all things? 
Now, the philosophy of our age in the UK is that all gods and ways of living are equal. And Psalm 96 goes, nah, our God's better because he made the heavens. Do you believe that? Do you believe that the God of the Bible in every way makes all other things that we trust in look naff? One village I went to in northern Vietnam had a a spirit tree. Many of the Vietnamese have a very strong belief in spirits. In the language of verse 4, they fear the spirits. Now, this village had a spirit that inhabited, and I believe believe in spirits and demons, and there may well have been something real about this, a spirit that inhabited a tree. And so they would honor and revere this spirit because for them, everything will be all right when uh, the spirit is kind to us. So they had this old, decrepit tree that was, was, that was dying, and it was propped up by poles, because if the tree fell down, they were afraid that the spirit would then be released to kind of wreak havoc on the people of the village. Okay, so let's stop and think about this spirit God in comparison with the God of the Bible. Well, God doesn't need a tree to live in, does he? Verse 5, the Lord made the heavens. He made the tree. And he's not some malicious spirit that goes around tormenting people. Our God is the one who says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. You see, he's better than the spirit which grips this village in Vietnam. And so they need to hear about him so that they can sing our song and be released from their fear of this spirit. God's too good to keep to ourselves. Do you see that this God is better than the consumerism that grips the people of France? Everything will be all right when we can enjoy stuff, they say. Okay, so let's stop and think about consumerism as a God compared to this God. Think how an income can be snatched away with one accident that means you can't work. Think how a dream can be lost with a failed exam or a missed promotion. Think how our most prized possessions break and get chipped. I don't think I've ever seen an iPhone that doesn't have a chip in the corner of it. What's with that? Think how that God of things will fail the people of France when on their deathbed they can take none of it with them. But our God, verse 6, splendor and majesty are before him, strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Illness can't take him away from us, strength and glory are his. He can't be chipped. His splendor and majesty don't get replaced with the next model. He's better than stuff. And because he's better than the idol of consumerism that grips the people of France, well, he's too good to keep to ourselves, isn't he? We have got to go and tell them. God is better than the God of Muslims who is utterly graceless. Our God gave himself as a guarantee of salvation. Our God is better than the serene and silent Buddha who stares on the suffering of half a billion Buddhists, telling them that their suffering is an illusion. Our God came into the world and suffered on the cross, and rose again to give us new bodies and a new creation instead of this endless cycle of reincarnation. God's too good to keep to ourselves because he's better than the gods of this world. And so, in verse 7, we call the world to join our song. Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of the nations, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. So if, as a church, you want to be serious about world mission, you need something to keep, keep you going, something compelling to keep you at it. Because serious world mission is really costly. It will cost us in the tears of goodbyes. It will cost us lots of money. It will cost us in prayer and decades-long investment in care. It will cost those who go to leave homes, jobs, families, the familiarity of life in England. And cost after cost will break us down unless we're sustained by something really compelling. We need a huge and majestic view of God in comparison with the puny and harmful lies of the gods of the world. When we see and feel and sing ourselves of a God who created the cosmos, who set the stars into place, 
who with a word tames the raging seas, who with a gentle hand made little girls come alive, who with a shout called Lazarus from the grave, who with authority pronounced, your sins are forgiven, who with a cry said it is finished, who with blazing glory will return. When we believe in that God, we will be sustained in sacrificial and costly mission because then we'll really believe that our God is too good to keep to ourselves while the world scrapes around in its worship of gods that don't compare. God's too good to keep to ourselves because he's better. Next, let's, let's see that God's too good to keep to ourselves because he reigns. Look at verse 9. We get this call to sing and worship again. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the world, peoples with equity. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. So we get more calls to join in with this happy and noisy praise of God. Rejoice, rejoice, he keeps saying. Be glad, everyone, everything, fish, animals, fields, people, worship the Lord. Because of the reality of God's reign. Do you see in verse 10, the message of hope we have for the nations is, verse 10, say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The fact of God's supremacy over all things as King of kings and Lord of lords is the reason why all creation should join in this almighty sound of praise. In particular, the psalmist zooms in on the fair and righteous judgment of God. You see that in verse 10? He will judge the peoples with equity. Verse 13, he comes to judge the earth. Now, when we hear the word judgment, we often think of that as a very negative word, just a kind of another word for condemnation. That's jumping the gun slightly. We're going to come to that. But this is a bigger reality about the justice of God's reign. And when you think about it, our world is it's crying out for justice, isn't it? The way things look is that the world is ruled by people, powers, and ideologies that are a law unto themselves. Did you know this? That Boko Haram in Nigeria have killed 10,000 people. 10,000. They're a law unto themselves. Vietnamese girls in villages in the north are being sold out by friends to traffickers to take them across the border into China. Husbands return home drunk to hurt their wives across our land. 893 babies were aborted in the U.S. in 2016. And so for all these tragedies and injustices, to all those broken families and war-torn lands, we have a message too good to keep to ourselves, don't we? The Lord reigns, not those oppressive powers. The Lord reigns. There is justice. There is a faithful and righteous judge who sees everything and will, verse 13, 13 come to judge the earth. He'll right every wrong. The Lord reigns. That's good news. So that's kind of big picture God's reign. But the justice of God has implications for every individual in this room and across the planet. Because verse 13 says he will judge the world in righteousness. And that is the crunch word for us. Because while the world cries out for justice, at the same time we also commit injustice ourselves every day. God is our creator. And so he has the right to the singing of every human on the planet. But like we saw earlier, we all say everything will be all right when replace God, put something else there. We don't want anything to do with him. Something else takes his place. Do you think God's chilled about that? That we've replaced him? Do you think God can care about the injustices in our world and yet not care about the cause of injustice, our personal replacement of him? So come again. This is good news that the Lord reigns. It sounds a lot like bad news for us right now. Well, it is good news. 
because our God's the best God. And so he's done something for our world. Let me read to you from Romans 10, verse 9. Listen to this. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is the Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. See, the Lord reigns could be put another way. Jesus is Lord. It's another way of saying it. The Lord reigns. Jesus is Lord. And so if people hear that and confess with their mouths that he is God's rescuer king, and if they believe that God raised him from the dead, they will be saved. The Lord Jesus, who will be the one who will come to judge the whole world, was judged instead of the world when he died on the cross, instead of you and me. So that anyone, Psalm 96 says, anyone who sings the song of Jesus as Lord and Savior will be saved from this coming judgment. God is too good to keep to ourselves because he reigns. Jesus is God's reigning king who can save us from his judgment to come. So don't keep God to yourselves as a church. Don't let these walls or this city be the limits of his praise. The peoples of the world can be saved if we will play our part in sending people out to go and teach them a new song, the song of Christ the King. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to begin by confessing our part in replacing you, in worshipping other gods, created things, instead of you, the, the creator, surrounded by splendor and power. We're so sorry that we, we're suckers for things that won't satisfy, which damage us, damage others. You are so much better. And I pray so much that you would help us to really believe that ourselves. That before we think about telling other people, you do work in our hearts, that this church family would really treasure the Lord Jesus Christ above all, that would truly be able to say, God is better than all other gods. Help us to believe that, and we're sorry when we don't. And I pray that you would lead us, Lord, in our every day with people around us to tell them about you, teach them the song of praise that we sing. But Lord, please lift our vision. Lift our vision from what's immediately in front of us to the billions in our world who don't know this song, whose praise is silent, but you deserve it. You deserve their praise. And we ask that even as a result of today, more people would take on their lips this song of praise, this new song, that the Lord reigns, that Jesus is Lord. Amen.